up to you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Thanks for that kind introduction and thanks for showing up here. I, I often wonder, were I a student at Oxford, would I show up uh, to hear some American politicians speak? Probably not, but I don't know. Uh, when I think of American politicians, a couple of things come to mind. One is the origin of the word politics itself. It consists of two Greek roots. Uh, the first one being poly, which means many, and the second, which are ticks, which are blood-sucking parasites. And you <laughs> <coughs> My late father used to say that it's, um, it's no coincidence that uh, w when we like someone and we know someone who is overweight, we call them slim. When we know someone who is bald, we call them curly. And uh, when we know a politician, we introduce them as the honorable. Uh, <laughs> It's interesting how that rolls at times. I've been in the United States Senate now for about six and a half years. Still haven't gotten used to the, 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 that title or being described as a politician. You see, I, I'm a lawyer by training, and, and uh, now that I'm uh, an elected official and a uh, member of the United States Senate, I, I, I've somehow managed to get into an even more hated class than I belonged to previously. <laughs> um, my, my, my dad, who I quoted a minute ago, was also a lawyer. And he had this little plaque on his wall that said, yes, I'm a lawyer, but please don't tell my mother because she thinks I play the piano in a bordello. <laughs> uh, I've been in the Senate for uh, about six and a half years. I was elected in 2010. Uh, it was the first time I had ever held elected office. Um, and at the time I arrived in the Senate, I was 39 years old. I, I, in order to try to fit in, I would try to tell my colleagues that even though I was only 39, I could read at the level of a 40-year-old. They didn't seem that impressed. Uh, when I first got to the Senate, I would routinely uh, get carded. I don't know whether that's a word in the UK, but carded. Uh, being carded is something that happens in the United States. When you go into a bar and you order an alcoholic beverage, if you look like you might be too young to be there, they'll ask for your identification, um, uh, or so they say. Uh, as a non-drinker myself, it, it was uh, an unusual experience for me. But I got carded every time I would go to cast a vote in the United States Senate because they didn't think I looked like a senator. They were not interested in seeing my birth certificate or my driver's license. They wanted to see a very specific card. I'll see if I have mine here. My, my Senate identification, which um, has my picture on it. It says that I'm a United States senator representing the state of Utah. Uh, it has a tamper resistant strip on it just so that they could tell that it was real. And every time I would go and vote, these heavily armed uh, security guards at the Capitol would stop and look at it and um, uh, th decide whether they could let me in. And they'd also notice this little e eerie inscription on the bottom of it where it said expiration January 3rd, 2017. And I, I had to explain to my wife and our three children one of whom is here with me today, James. Uh, wave to everyone, James. <laughs> James is a political science student at Brigham Young University in Utah. I had to explain to them that that is not the date when I personally expire. That's just my term of office. <laughs> Every time I went to vote, I would have to do this. Until finally one day I explained to one of my colleagues, I, I'm tired of getting carded. What, what do you do to not get carded? And he said, well, that's why you wear the pin. What pin? They gave you a little lapel pin when you were sworn in. And I said, yeah, I know. I put that in my desk drawer and I closed the drawer. It's not really my thing. I'm, I'm not into accessories. And he said, wear it, because it's worn only by senators. So I put it on my lapel. And ever since then, that thing has been my constant companion when I'm in Washington. Uh, because when I wear it, I don't get carded. And I've even named the pin. I call it my sorry senator pin. Because if they do card me, I point to the pin and they say, oh, sorry, senator, you can come on in. <laughs> One time, I, after I had been in the Senate for a, a long time, far too long for this to still be continuing, and I had my pin on that day, I was on the Senate floor in between votes, and I had one arm gently resting on the desk in front of me, thinking about how the vote was going to turn out. And at that moment, a security guard came up to me and said in a very harsh tone of voice, excuse me, sir, will you please not lean on the senator's desk? And I said, I'm terribly sorry. It won't happen again. Um, you see, they're very protective of the senator's desks because uh, most of those desks in the U.S. Senate chamber are original equipment, which means they date back to about 1860 when the current wing uh, of, uh, uh, of the Capitol uh, occupied by the Senate was completed, which means that those desks are themselves almost as old as some of my colleagues in the United States Senate. 
I said I, I didn't realize I was putting any pressure on it. It won't happen again. But this wasn't enough for the security guard. He proceeded to interrogate me. He, he said, are you with the minority, meaning the minority party? Uh, I'm a Republican. The Republican Party was the minority party in the Senate at the time. And, and I said, well, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm a Republican. Uh, are you asking whether I'm with them on this vote or the next? I'm not sure why we're having this conversation. He said, no, are you with the minority leader? And I said, I, Mitch McConnell is our leader. I, I, uh, again, I'm not sure why you're asking this. Are you part of the minority leader's staff? And then I realized, okay, he doesn't know who I am. And so I decided to correct him gently, but I mumbled it because I wasn't accustomed to using my title. Still, I'm not, don't like it. It makes me queasy. And so I said, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Senator Lee. What? And I said, okay, my name is Mike Lee. I represent a state called Utah. It's sort of squarish. It resembles a chair. It's in the Rocky Mountains. We have lovely seeing really the best snow on earth. And at that point, he figured out who I was. And he told me in one hurried breath, as all the color seemed to drain from his face, I'm terribly sorry for the misunderstanding. My name is Steve, if you want to report me. And then he ran for the door. <laughs> but, you know, it was an honest mistake. So I chased after Steve just to tell him it's not a big deal. It could have happened to anyone, but Steve was way too fast. <laughs> so from then on, every time I saw Steve in the hall, I would wave to him and I would smile and I would say, hi, Steve, just so that Steve knew there were no hard feelings between us. It was not a big deal. We, we became friends. Steve retired a few years ago. And it was at about that moment it occurred to me, his name's probably not Steve. <laughs> I, <laughs> for all I know, it's Bob. Uh, Steve's a guy he works with that he hates. I, I, but I, I, I had to do something that day that I didn't want to do. I had to use my title. I had to assert my right to be there. I didn't want to have to do it. Uh, but had I not done so, I would have lost something. I would have lost the opportunity to vote that day. The three million people I represent would not have had me representing them in that chamber that day. It would have been taken away from me, even though I had just earned the right to be there. I had been granted the right to be there. And I've thought about that story many times in the sense that uh, all of us have certain things that are ours that have to be asserted. Not just members of the United States Senate, not just elected officials, uh, but all of us in one way or another have certain rights that are properly ours. And sometimes if those rights are not asserted, unless they're asserted aggressively, vigilantly, even when, especially when it's difficult, some of those rights sometimes will cease to be as meaningful as they otherwise would be and could be and should be. In the United States, we have an interesting system of government. It's somewhat unique in the world that it was especially unique at the time when we undertook this experiment. Uh, but our, in our system of government, we have a number of rights, a number of things that we have identified that the government cannot do to us. Uh, we also have other rights that consist themselves in a structure, in a form, that is policy agnostic, that is uh, 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 politically uh, uh, detached from any, any type of modern political preference. There are two features of uh, the United States Constitution that make it somewhat distinct and that were somewhat revolutionary at the time it was put in place. Uh, those structural protections are as important as any other thing that we have decided government cannot do to us. How government goes about something, which arm of government acts, if at all, and how it does those things matters. And it matters in a way that I think modern American society hasn't always appreciated, but needs to come to appreciate more than it does today. I believe we have to come to assert those rights more faithfully, even when it's difficult. And in fact, it's especially when it's difficult that it's important to assert them. Let me explain what I mean. There are two structural protections at the heart of the United States Constitution. One operates on the vertical axis, the other horizontal. On the vertical axis, we have a division of power that we refer to as federalism. The idea in the US constitutional system is that most powers in government are to be left close to the people, to be exercised at the state and local level where it's close to the people. The idea here is not that local government and state government is always best or that it's somehow infallible. Quite to the contrary, state and local governments mess up all the time. 
Why? Well, because they're governments and because governments are run by people. People, while redeemable, are imperfect. They're flawed, they're selfish, and they engage in self-interested behavior. That's exactly why we have governments, because human beings are flawed. And it's why we have rules surrounding government, to make sure that government doesn't become abusive of those powers. So when we place most of the power in our system of government, close to the people at the state and local level, we make those powers easier to turn around. Imagine the difference between turning around a small boat or a jet ski, a personal watercraft, on the one hand, and on the other hand, turning around a battleship or an aircraft carrier. One can be turned around in less than a second. The other might take some time and is much more difficult to maneuver. In our system of government in the United States, we're supposed to be able to honor local preferences or regional differences in how people choose to govern without having to make everything a national concern. Our founding fathers, those who drafted our Constitution, uh, convened in the, in the city of Philadelphia uh, in the summer of 1787, and they came up with a list of powers that they knew would have to be vested in a national government, things that were distinctively, unavoidably, necessarily national in the case of our government. Those included the <coughs> power to provide for our national defense, to declare war, to regulate trade or commerce with foreign nations uh, and, and among and between the states, to coin money and regulate the value thereof, to come up with a uniform system of weights and measures, of postal roads, to protect intellectual property, trademarks, copyrights, and patents. And then there's my personal favorite power of Congress, the power to grant letters of mark and reprisal. Mark in this instance is spelled with a Q. I'm convinced that it probably is found more frequently in English parlance than it is in the United States, but a letter of mark and reprisal is a hall pass issued by the United States Congress that allows the person holding it to engage in state-sponsored acts of piracy on the high seas, which is really, really cool if you think about it. <laughs> I have no idea how long I will serve in the United States Senate, but one day I'm going to get a letter of mark and reprisal. I'm going to be a pirate. I will have a parrot and a flag with a skull and crossbones. So you're all invited to join me. <laughs> but my point is that on that list of powers that I mentioned, outlined in the United States Constitution, you will not find a catch-all. You will not find something that says Congress shall be empowered to legislate in all cases whatsoever of concern to the American people. These are discrete, distinct, finite powers, or were intended to be such at the time they were written. That's the vertical separation that we call federalism. There is a horizontal separation that we call separation of powers. It refers to the three functions of government uh, and the three branches of government created by the Constitution itself. Uh, one branch, the one where I work, Congress, consisting of the Senate and the House of Representatives, has one job and it's to make the laws. All legislative powers, all lawmaking powers in the federal government are supposed to belong to us. And we're elected for limited periods of time to make any and all federal law arising during that period of time. Senators like me are elected for six-year increments, members of the House of Representatives for two-year increments. We're the branch of the federal government most accountable to the people, the most subject to popular will, and most replaceable by the people at regular intervals. Uh, then you've got another branch headed by the president, the executive branch, whose job it is to enforce the laws. And then you've got the other branch, the judicial branch, headed by the Supreme Court, whose job it is to interpret the laws. In the United States, over the last 80 years, we have drifted steadily away from both our vertical protection called federalism and our horizontal protection that we refer to as separation of powers. And just to be perfectly clear that this is not a partisan statement, this has occurred under the management of houses of representatives, senates, and presidencies of every conceivable partisan combination. Members of my party have at times been uh, as great of offenders of federalism and separation of powers as the other political party in the United States. Both parties have colluded, in effect, over the course of the last 80 years to take power away from the American people in two steps. First, away from the people where they exercise most powers of government at the state and local level and move it to Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. And then a second time, within Washington, D.C., we've taken the 
<coughs> lawmaking power away from the legislative branch. The people's elected representatives in Congress have voluntarily relinquished that power and handed it over to unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats as part of the executive branch. We have done this to our own peril and to our own detriment. That is to the detriment of most of the American people. In other words, although American, America has enjoyed immense economic growth in recent decades, we have also seen in more recent years a concentration of power and of wealth and of influence in the hands of a relatively few group of people, a relatively small group of people. <coughs> At the same time we've consolidated all that power, we've seen an interesting trend. Currently six of the ten wealthiest counties in the United States of America are suburbs of Washington, D.C. Now this is an area that, while lovely, produces nothing, it manufactures nothing, it's not the home of any vast store of natural resources, whether we're talking about precious metals, uh, energy, uh, oil, uh, it's not a banking hub, it's not uh, a technological innovation <coughs> hub. The money is there only because the power is there, concentrated in the hands of a few elite uh, individuals, a few uh, 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 elites who end up benefiting as this power is concentrated even more among <laughs> the people. Which gets us back to why it is that we needed those structural protections to begin with. Why is it so important? Why does it matter? Wouldn't it be more efficient to concentrate more power anyway within our national government, where there can be a whole lot of expertise, where there can be a whole lot of specialization, and where uniformity can bring about uh, perhaps easier compliance in certain circumstances, instead of having to navigate a 50-state patchwork quilt of multifarious and inconsistent regulatory standards, uh, someone wanting to comply with the law can learn just one. There are some efficiencies to be sure, but those efficiencies can't offset the fact that we're not making law the way that it's supposed to be made and we're allowing for the concentration of power in the hands of the few. We do moreover have the fact that the whole reason we put this in place in the first place is not because we believe in limited government in the abstract, not just because it sounds nice, uh, uh, much as it sounded nice when in the movie Braveheart, uh, uh, the, the, the character of uh, William Wallace calls out freedom in the end. It's not just that it, we like how it sounds, it's about protecting the dignity of the individual human soul. You see, governments are not perfect, and bad things tend to happen when we attribute to governments characteristics that we often reserve for deity, characteristics that no mortal ever has or will have, characteristics that uh, we shouldn't give to other mortal human beings. In the American system of government, we have as a background understanding, the fact that governments are themselves reflections of human nature. We don't have a government that can operate itself. Governments are necessarily <coughs> operated by human beings. So as James Madison explained, uh, as he was advocating for the ratification of our Constitution after it had been drafted, but before it had taken effect, trying to convince the requisite number of states to ratify this document that would govern our land. He explained this concept and he said government is a reflection of human nature. Uh, if human beings were angels, we wouldn't need governments at all because we'd be angels and we'd be doing good deeds and playing our harps and we wouldn't mess with each other, we wouldn't uh, hurt people, we wouldn't take their stuff. So we wouldn't need government at all, but we're not angels. And because we're not angels, we need government. Because government has to be run by human beings who are just as fallible as we are. Um, we don't have angels to govern over us. We have to have rules to govern the humans who govern us. That's why it matters. That's why it's important to keep this power limited. It prevents any one person or any one group of people from amassing too much power because bad things happen when that occurs. I'd like to talk for a minute about some of those bad things that can happen. 
I keep in my office in Washington, D.C., two sets of documents uh, that help me explain how this power has been concentrated in the hands of the few in Washington, D.C. One set of documents is a few inches tall. Uh, for most years, it's either a few hundred or at most a few thousand pages long, uh, usually standing about that high. Next to it, I have another stack of documents uh, that is 97,000 pages long. It's 13 feet tall. The first stack, the small one, uh, the one that's usually a few inches tall, consists of all the laws passed by Congress last year. The stack that's 13 feet tall and 97,000 pages long, that's last year's Federal Register. The Federal Register in the United States is the annual index of federal regulations as they are initially released for public comment and then as they're finalized. They become, in effect, laws. It's just that they're laws made not by people who stand for election at regular intervals, but by unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats. Well, bureaucrats who, to be fair, are by and large very hardworking individuals, often highly specialized, uh, 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 well-intentioned and hardworking, but they cannot be fired by the people. That's an important distinction. The fact that that many of our laws are being made at the federal level at all, and that that many, uh, uh, that larger proportion of our federal laws are being made by men and women who are not elected is itself disturbing to Americans, especially when they consider some of the effects that it has on those least able to afford the costs of complying with them. Let me explain what I mean. I was mortified 20 years ago when I was in law school when I first started monitoring this issue to learn that the federal regulations uh, in effect in the United States were, were costing the American economy about $300 billion a year. I was especially concerned to hear about this when it was explained to me that even though it may appear uh, that these costs are borne by large uh, wealthy corporate interests, in fact, uh, these costs are passed downstream. Most of the costs of complying with these regulations are actually paid for by hardworking men and women, by poor and middle class individuals who pay for the cost of compliance with those federal regulations in terms of higher <coughs> prices on goods, higher prices on services, diminished wages, unemployment, and underemployment. And so uh, it was explained to me at the time, in effect, this, this is kind of like a backdoor, invisible, highly regressive tax. It's a tax that you don't get to see a receipt for. You don't get a tax return at the end of the year. You don't ever have a calculation of how much these regulations are costing you. And it's hurting the poor and middle class disproportionately. Since that time, cost of compliance with U.S. federal regulations has skyrocketed roughly sevenfold to around $2 trillion every single year. Uh, this has happened at the exact same time that while, while America has continued to enjoy a degree of economic growth, number one, some of that growth has, has slowed, but number two, a lot of that growth has not been realized as much as it has in the past by America's poor and middle class. America has been said to be a somewhat unique place in that it is a place where someone could be born into poverty, hoping one day that if they worked hard and played by the rules, they might retire comfortably, in some cases wealthy, but at least comfortably. Uh, this is the so-called American dream. It's not to say that it's unique to the United States of America, but it's something that has been perceived in America. It's something that has been realized in, in America to a very significant degree. And it's something that uh, some Americans can tend to take for granted sometimes. I remember um, a couple of decades ago, I, I was speaking to an individual who at the time worked for my wife's father. And uh, I, I, he, his name was Damien. Damien was from Mexico. He was there on a, on a seasonal work visa. He did some work for my father-in-law. I'm fluent in Spanish, and I always relish the opportunity to speak to Damien. I uh, found him interesting. He was funny. He spoke very good Spanish, being from Mexico, and, and it gave me a chance to sharpen my skills. One day we were talking, and I was a asking him, what do you really think of my father-in-law? And uh, he, he told me he liked him. And then he told me, 
in Spanish, maybe one day I'll work for you. This made me uncomfortable as an American. And instinctively, without even thinking about it, I, I said back to him in Spanish, maybe one day I'll work for you. And he looked at me like that was the strangest thing I, uh, that he had ever heard, and I immediately felt kind of awkward. I realized my mistake. He had been raised in a culture where upward mobility wasn't the norm, where someone who worked as a gardener wouldn't necessarily have aspirations uh, to, to go to college and, or, or the hope of realizing that opportunity. That has stuck with me as an experience that has reminded me how important it is that we have an upward mobility society, that we make our land a place where someone can come in to the world or come into our nation in poverty and have the reasonable hope and expectation that they might be able to better their station in life. At a minimum, our government shouldn't be in the way of doing that. And one of the things that can happen when too much power is accumulated in the hands of the few is that we make it more difficult for that very thing to happen. Within the United States system of government, we have a very strong risk, I believe, of allowing some individuals, having climbed to the top rungs of the economic ladder, to pull up the ladder from behind them, sometimes with the assistance of government itself making it difficult or impossible for those beneath them to climb. Uh, we have this in, in the United States as an ongoing risk. Not all of the risks are found in the federal government. Some of the risks exist in the state and local governments as well. I don't know what, whether the United Kingdom does this. I don't know whether it's a problem here. But in the United States, we have a problem with occupational licensing. We have overregulated nearly every industry imaginable. Uh, we have stories of people who have been threatened with felony prosecutions for engaging in a specialty for which they're not licensed. And in some circumstances, you'll have people threatened with prosecution if they are braiding hair without a cosmetology license or a hairdressing license. Uh, there is one circumstance where a woman was threatened with prosecution if she kept practicing her trade as a hair braider unless she went and got 2,000 hours of training and apprenticeship, which she then did and never once learned the hair braiding skills that she already had when, and what was already utilizing in the workplace. She was teaching her teachers how to do the very kind of hair braiding she already knew how to do. This is one of many examples of how when we allow for the concentration of too much power in government and when we treat government almost with a uh, religious-like admiration, uh, almost as we would an omniscient, omnipotent, sentient being, uh, that we can end up creating problems. Our constitutional system of government is one of those things that protects us against that. When we follow the structure, when we follow the text, we are able to protect the dignity of the human soul. One of the many things that I love uh, about visiting the United Kingdom is the fact that so much about our system of government uh, comes uh, from the United Kingdom. I, I look at the United States system of government, at our system of constitutional law, at our Declaration of Independence, and I see how much it was influenced uh, by John Locke, for example. John Locke, who studied here on this campus, uh, initially to become a physician, uh, was a, a great thinker who influenced the way we view government, and most importantly, the way we view the dignity of the human soul. Uh, the legitimacy of uh, the human spirit uh, in his writings. And even though many of those writings didn't become famous, didn't become well-known, didn't become as persuasive as they would after his death, they made their way into the U.S. legal system. The fact that our Declaration of Independence acknowledges that, that uh, uh, all human beings have certain inalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that came from Locke himself, who understood that because human beings uh, are basically good, they're flawed, but basically good, they have a desire to be free, and they have these rights that are distinctively theirs. Those have to be protected. They don't belong to any government, and no government has the right to take them away. In order for those rights to be meaningful, they must be asserted. And it's not just the fundamental rights themselves, but the structural protections around them 
that have to be continually reasserted every day for them to have meaning, for them to protect each of us. As we do that, we'll be free as a people, we'll be prosperous as a people, and we will retain for our descendants <coughs> that which we in have inherited from our ancestors. It's an honor to be here and to speak to you about this tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lee. That was uh, fascinating. And thank you so much for, uh, for coming to speak here this evening. You. Um, you touched on, on, um, on quite a few of the challenges that the US uh, faces uh, going forward. Um, what I want to ask, ask you is what do you think the biggest challenge is for the US uh, going <coughs> forward? One of the many manifestations of uh, the problems that I've described tonight uh, is our national debt, uh, which stands at around $20 trillion right now. Now, $20 trillion is a lot of money. Uh, our interest on that national debt is about $250 billion a year, which is an enormous amount of money. But that's not the scary part. The scary part is that that annual interest payment is roughly the same as it was 20 years ago when our national debt was, what, a sixth of its current size or something like that. The only reason that our annual interest payment on that debt is only $250 billion a year is because we have these all-time historic low treasury yield rates, which have uh, been achieved through a, a, a very interesting, complex process. But it's a process that cannot go on in perpetuity, meaning the laws of mathematics are such that what goes down must inevitably ultimately come up. And, and as soon as our annual, uh, as soon as our treasury yield rates return to something even approaching their historical average, it won't be very long until we're spending more like a trillion dollars a year just on interest on our national debt instead of 250 billion a year. That has stunning implications for everything, not only in our system of government, but for our, our culture as a whole. There, uh, there, there is not a tax increase I can fathom that could predictably, sustainably yield uh, the difference. You know, we're going to have to come up with another, what, 750 billion or so a year on top of our existing deficit in order to sustain that. I, I can't fathom a tax increase capable of doing that without simultaneously slowing uh, economic growth or, or even resulting in negative growth. Uh, nor can I fathom that we could achieve austerity cuts sufficient to take that down in a sufficient years. What do we do then? Do we print more? Do we borrow more? Thus causing the treasury yield rate to go up even more and, and widening this gulf that I described. So I, I see that as perhaps the single most glaring manifestation uh, of this fundamental challenge. The, the whole reason we're in that situation to begin with is because in the United States, we have come again under the leadership of Republicans and Democrats alike over the last 80 years to view the federal government as a sort of Swiss army knife. It's, it's there for whatever ails us, anything we want, any problem that we have is something that we turn to the federal government for, uh, but it's not sustainable. Okay. Um, obviously, um, sort of the elephant in the room is the fact that a lot of people at Oxford, for example, aren't great supporters of Donald Trump. And, and in, in his campaign, you were an adamant supporter of Cruz and, and even questioned Trump, uh, President Trump's commitment to the Constitution. How do you think his administration has performed so far? Look, um, the day he took office, regardless of what you might think about Donald Trump, regardless of what else you might think about him, there is a statement that he made in his inaugural address that I, I think he firmly believes and I think is very important. When he said, I want this to be about much more than just a transfer of power from one administration to another, one president to another, one party to another. I want this to be the beginning of a transfer of power from Washington, D.C. back to the American people. This message, to the extent he will stay with it, could be the most unifying and powerful theme of his presidency. And it's one that I believe has potential 
to garner support even from, especially from some of his most ardent critics. Um, and, and, and so if, if, if you don't like Donald Trump, if he makes you nervous, that ought to be an argument in favor of restoring the American system of federalism and of separation of powers. The fact that people can fear so much what one individual might do might perhaps be trying to tell us something about how far we've drifted from our system of government, which is supposed to preclude any individual from becoming so powerful that people can fear him that much. So far, this president has uh, done a number of things that I think are consistent with a move in that direction. For every new federal regulation his administration has issued, he's taken down either 15 or 16 old regulations. Um, he ha has tried to move in the direction of federalism and separation of powers. And so, so far, he appears to have a desire to do that that's much stronger than what we see out of Congress. Uh, I wish Congress were ready to proceed in that direction. But I hope that it will, and, and, and I will continue to invite, especially my Democratic colleagues, to join me in this cause. This is an either issue that is neither Republican nor Democratic. It's neither liberal nor conservative. This is simply an American ideal, and, and it is a, an ideal rooted in freedom, in the dignity of the human soul. Okay. Um, one, of, one of the main uh, contentious issues that have come up over the last couple of months um, was with regards to the Paris Agreement. And you were one of the uh, 22 <coughs> senators who um, opposed staying in uh, uh, the, and following the, the Paris Agreement. Why? What led you to, to follow this direction? It's not a good deal for the United States. I mean, look, we, uh, under that agreement, uh, we're asked to contribute a lot of money uh, uh, under the understanding that other countries are going to comply. Meanwhile, we in the United States do have a commitment to the rule of law that many signatories to that same agreement don't have. And if what we're going to do is dump a whole lot of money into something that others are not going to comply with, and we are, it's not a good deal for us. On, on Friday, we hosted um, Jeffrey Sachs, The Economist, uh, and a point that he raised, um, sort of with, with regards to that, is that uh, a lot of politicians are so transfixed and keep using the bu buzzword of growth. And indeed, in your first answer, you sort of mentioned growth quite a lot. And the issue with using that buzzword is it doesn't always encompass all of the factors that uh, you should be encompassing when you're look measuring a su the success of a country. So growth is usually economical, whereas uh, what you should uh, do to measure success is incorporate social, environmental. Do you think, um, how, how would you respond to that sort of interpretation? Do you think, how would you, how do you think we should measure success of a country? Um, because yes, okay, we might be pouring more money uh, into sort of uh, the Paris Agreement because of, uh, that, that saves and adds such an environmental benefit to that. How do you sort of conflict and, and, and compromise with those? Okay, uh, the, the fact that growth is not the only data point that we can follow um, doesn't mean that it's not itself important. I think it, it still is important to measure growth, to project it and to make decisions around projected growth and to figure out what it is that we can do to spur it on. But you're exactly right. There's, uh, there, there are lots of other factors that we need to follow. In fact, as, as the, the vice chairman of the Joint Economic Committee in Congress, uh, I've started something called the Social Capital Project where we're trying to identify some other, um, other things that we're not accustomed to tracking, other data points uh, that we haven't grown accustomed to tracking in the past. Uh, we're looking at um, social connectedness, cohesiveness, um, deaths of despair, uh, suicide deaths, deaths by drug overdose, things like that, things that, that help us understand what's happening to our society, to our culture. I, I do think we have to follow those as well. And, and the, the second big issue uh, that has come up in the last couple of months is, is, is probably one um, uh, you're most notable for, which is sort of healthcare. Um, and you were one of the senators that was working on the uh, American Healthcare <coughs> Act. Can you just talk through that process and, and sort of the thought sure. process? Sure. Um. Um, <clears throat> Republicans have campaigned for seven and a half years on one unifying message, uh, which is repealing Obamacare. That's not to say that every other Republican campaigning for federal office on every other issue has been... Uh, you know, running either this way or that way, but it is one of the few unifying 
strains that has run within the Republican Party is that the uh, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, as it's known colloquial, uh, colloquially in the United States, has made health care more expensive and less accessible for the American people. Uh, my goal after last November's election happened was to make sure that we did that, to make sure that we repealed as much of Obamacare as we possibly could. And this gets back to the central theme I was describing earlier. For purposes of my role as a United States Senator, I, I, I take a position of decided agnosticism as to what government in general might do with regard to health care. In other words, there are some states like Vermont where most of the people would much prefer a single-payer, government-run, government-funded health care system. I say, let them do it. Uh, this is not an issue that is made uh, unavoidably federal by the Constitution, and as such, it's something that ought to belong to the states to do anyway. If the people of Vermont want a single-payer system, let them do it. They could do that much more effectively, more efficiently, more quickly, uh, more nimbly if the federal government weren't occupying such a large footprint. It's never going to work in the state of Utah for a variety of reasons. Uh, for a variety of reasons, it's never going to work in a whole lot of parts of the United States. There are vast regional, regional differences in the United States, uh, just among and between the states themselves, in terms of not only preferences about how people consume health care, but also uh, their geographic distribution within the state how health care is often provided, how it's paid for, what the costs are, uh, the, the concentration of health care professionals who choose to live in that state, all kinds of factors that vary dramatically from one state to, or to another. So uh, my, my goal in the Affordable Care Act debate was to, number one, repeal as much of it as possible, number two, with an eye toward returning as much power as possible to the states to let them decide on their own how they want to manage this. Um, if federal intrusion, if expanding the federal footprint in health care were something that by its very nature were likely to bring down the cost of health care, then good heavens, we should have seen the, a, a significant reduction in the cost of health care in the United States over the last few years. But what we have seen is quite the opposite. So everything I did in connection with that was with an eye toward repealing it. We failed. We failed miserably. The best explanation I can provide to you as to why we failed is that after campaigning for seven and a half years on a platform of repealing Obamacare, some Republicans decided they didn't want to do that after all. Reminds me of the line from Monty Python and the Holy Grail when uh, King Arthur says, on second thought, let's not go to Camelot. It's a silly place. And then he casually walks away. That's in effect what the Republican Party has done. And it's to our everlasting shame that we didn't keep that promise. More, more broadly, do you think healthcare is a right or a privilege? Uh, look, a right is not and never can be something the government must give to you that came from someone else. A right is something the government can never do to you. One of the most dangerous things I believe we can do is to dilute the concept of what it means to be a right was something which isn't a right. It might be a policy that you like. It might be an ideal. It's not a right. If you're talking about something the government must provide for you, that isn't a right. That's something else, but it's not a right. Okay. Um, my last question before we open up uh, to the audience. Um, you once said that the GA, uh, GOP should be reconnecting with forgotten Americans. Who are these forgotten Americans, and do you think the GOP, um, what, is, what has the GOP done, in your opinion, um, and is, the right, is that the right way to go? The Republican Party, the GOP, has worn, almost as if it were a badge of honor, something that is in fact a badge of shame. It has worn and displayed almost proudly this badly caricatured image of the conservative movement as being the movement for the top 1%, for the country club, for the elite. It is not that. I am a Republican because I'm a conservative, and I'm a conservative because I believe that the best way to create an upwardly mobile society, to, to provide economic mobility, especially among America's poor middle class, is for government to understand its role 
and to protect the people against the deleterious effects of the excessive accumulation of power in the hands of the few. So the Republican Party has worn that badly caricatured label almost as if it were a badge of honor when in fact it's not and it has failed to a significant degree to, to connect the dots to explain why it is that we are conservative, what it is that the conservative vision is. When we fail to do that, we, are, we remain doomed throughout that failure uh, 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 to, um, uh, we, we're going to fail to be able to accomplish our task when we can't even connect the dots and say this is why we are conservative. We are conservative because we believe that poor and middle class individuals will have a better shot at a better life if we keep government and the federal government in particular in its proper lane. Okay, thank you. Um, right, we're going to open up to the audience now. So if you have a question, please raise your hand nice and high and then wait until the microphone uh, comes to you. Uh, let's start. Yeah, just you on the end. Senator, you mentioned government colluding to take away the power of the American people. And since 2010, Republican state governments have colluded to redraw electoral maps to give uh, members of your party a systematic electoral advantage. Uh, do you think that's a bigger problem than over-licensed hair braiders? Look, you take any issue and, and you compare it to hair braiding, and it's easy, it's easy to say, oh yeah, that's much more important than hair braiding uh, or, or than even occupational licensing. I, I, I see where you're going with that, but I, 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 I don't think that that um, is, as you described, that is not something that I would put on the same level as the kind of collusion that has resulted in the concentration of power within the federal government and then the transfer of power, of lawmaking power, over to ex executive branch bureaucracies. What you're describing is the playing out of a constitutionally authorized process. In our system of government, every 10 years we have a census, and that census is used to allocate uh, uh, representation uh, in the House of Representatives to decide <coughs> how many representatives each state will have, uh, w w th that, it, that, it, that is done federally, and then within each state legislature, that legislature gets to decide what the boundaries of each legislative district will be. That is the prerogative of that legislature. Uh, legislators, uh, legislatures are political bodies themselves, and they consist of people who run for office. Uh, and so insofar as those uh, legislatures, more of them, are currently occupied by Republicans than Democrats, it's not surprising to see that they're going to draw that with their Republican goals in mind. The interesting thing about the question you ask is that in the United States, it's often attacked um, by those who, who don't like it, and it often becomes the focus of a remedy that itself, I think, would be an even graver departure from the constitutional standard. Many who, who don't like the system as it is, the system the con Constitution <coughs> contemplates. Say, maybe each state should hand it off to a bipartisan uh, committee or commission. In other words, delegate more lawmaking power. It's more of the same thing that has created the uh, administrative state within the federal government. When legislators fail to legislate, when they delegate to someone else a task just because it's difficult or might result in an unpopular decision, it disconnects the people. It's not to say every state legislative decision is correct or even every redistricting decision is correct. A lot of these districts don't make a whole lot of sense unless you look at them through political lenses. But it is those political lenses that themselves give life to our system of government, which puts people in, in, in charge of it. When they don't like their representatives and the way they draw their legislative districts, they can fire them. I'm not aware of any other system uh, that, that would have this feature. So it's, it's not the point that we always get perfect government uh, in a Republican form of government, but it is the case that the people remain in charge. Great. Yeah, let's go to the back there. Yeah, that one there. Yeah. Sorry, I'll try to be faster. That was way too long. That's okay. I, I need Thank you so much for coming, Senator. You were one of the last members of Congress to oppose funding for the, Clint, for the Flint crisis in Michigan. I was just wondering if you'd like to discuss that. Yeah. 
In Flint, Michigan, there was a problem with water contamination. Um, I was never presented with an argument as to why, number one, a combination of the city of Flint and the state of Michigan, <coughs> the state of Michigan, which, by the way, at the time was operating with a significant surplus, couldn't handle this problem. Uh, unless the state is unable to handle it and unless it is for some reason proper for the federal government to take charge of that issue, there is a lot of harm that can come from Congress stepping in and saying we will do this. What you had in Flint, Michigan was the failure of a municipal public utility uh, that did some really bad things. If every time a municipal public utility does bad things, if Congress, without any certain uh, authority to do so, without any sense of inevitability as to why only Congress can handle this, if Congress steps in and funds the entirety of the uh, 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 repairs that need to be done, you're actually going to have more of the same types of crisis uh, crisis that occurred in Flint occurring elsewhere in the United States because it's an invitation for more federal money. So uh, here again, th this is yet another question of uh, which level of government. The fact that government should step in doesn't always mean it should be this government, meaning the one in Washington, D.C. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's go uh, the corner there. Yeah, you at the very corner back. Yeah. Hi, um, you mentioned that you wanted states to have more jurisdiction over their own laws. For example, you mentioned Vermont having health care and other states not. But however, do you not think that that creates an inequality between citizens and therefore may breach the 14th Amendment? Uh, no, no, I don't. The, f the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause does not guarantee uh, an equal outcome in terms of uh, their ability to live in an economy that is just as strong as their neighboring states. If that were the case, we would, all 50 states would in some way or another be in breach of the 14th Amendment as things stand now. That is not what the 14th Amendment says, not what it was intended, not what it ever could say. Quite to the contrary, uh, in the circumstance you described where each state had the ability to undertake something different, what works well in Vermont isn't necessarily going to work as well in neighboring New Hampshire or in distant Utah. Each state needs to be able to experiment according to local preferences uh, and local trends in that state, and I think we'd all be better off as a result. Okay. Yeah, uh, you in the red jumper. <coughs> Thank you. Um, stand up, I guess. Um, I'm a pretty staunch Bay Area liberal, but I think you make a very good case for federalism. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ultimately, it's a liberal issue, so we'd love to have you in the federalism um, case. <laughs> um, I have a question about um, the recent gun violence that's taken place um, back in the States, um, specifically about a comment that you made concerning gun violence um, on a Michael in the Morning podcast. Um, you said that there are deep cultural problems that sometimes can cause this kind of behavior and result in it. Those are more difficult to address than a simple change in the law, but it's not the change in the law that's going to protect us from people doing bad things. I'm wondering what it is you think about our culture in the U.S. Um, that leads these problems to occur. And then secondly, um, if the law's lack of efficacy is a reason not to have that law, then I'm wondering if um, something like the ineffectiveness of laws restricting abortion would be an argument um, in favor of not having uh, restrictions against abortion. Okay. In response to your second question, there is no debate on that point. The United States Supreme Court took that debatable matter beyond debate, made it federal, and took it out of the hands of the people uh, in 1973. That's the end of the issue. That's not even subject to debate anymore, at least outside the uh, halls of courts. Um, with regard to the first question, yeah, there are cultural issues that have led to the breakdown of families, which have in turn um, been accompanied by a corresponding increase in violence. Not just gun violence, but other forms of violence itself. And so, yeah, those are some of the cultural problems. By the time you have one of these shootings, there are a whole lot of laws that have been violated. I, I, I can't even enumerate for you the number of laws uh, that, that are violated every time someone uh, like this guy who opened fire tragically just a few days ago in Las Vegas did. And so if the creation of an additional law would stop something like that, we would all jump at the chance to do that. 
Um, the fact is, it's, it, it doesn't work that way. And in the United States in particular, uh, w whether you think it should have been this way from the outset or not, we have a lot of guns in the United States, uh, more per capita than, uh, than most countries do. And, and if, if you could snap your fingers and say, let's not have guns, and somehow all those guns disappeared, uh, if you could do that, and you could do that through the stroke of the executive pen or, or through legislation, uh, that would be one thing. But it's quite another thing when you have um, more than one gun for every man, woman, and child in America. Those guns, in fact, exist. The fact that they exist means that if you were to ban them, what you would do is end up with a whole lot of people who are already complying with the law who would relinquish their guns as required by law, and a whole lot of people who are not already obeying the law who would hold on to them, thus perpetuating the, the risk of violence, thus perpetuating the likelihood of victimization of those least able to protect themselves and less likely to be protectable by police in the moment that happens. It is a tragic consequence of where we are, but it is where we are. Uh, yeah, you in the grey top, yeah. Uh, hi, Senator. Um, so um, my question is basically, you know, why have you and many Republican colleagues, as you cited the debt as being the most important issue that we have to address, in your opinion, why, why, why is that the case, um, given that really, economically speaking, the absolute size of the debt is not necessarily that important, and what matters more is actually deficits and the impact that they're going to have on interest rates, investment, and consequently inflation as well. Because you cited the size of the interest payment and the way that that's going to grow uh, with the growing debt, but what really matters if we're talking about deficits mattering and not debt is that our economy and the, the revenue base keeps pace relative to the way the debt is actually growing. So it's not really so much about the absolute size of the debt. So I'm just curious uh, why you've raised the alarm about that as opposed to more talking about deficits. Yeah, no, yeah. fair point. Um, and if you listen to me, I was careful in that answer to say this is one manifestation of it. I always struggle when I'm asked what is the single biggest issue, but one uh, very easy to identify, easy to explain manifestation of the problem of excessive growth of federal government the explosion of the size, scope, reach, footprint of the federal government is the debt. But you're right. If, if we view the debt uh, in isolation, it's not as much of an issue uh, as it is when you look at the debt and deficit in relationship to the rate of growth. Um, that's much more important. But we do reach a point at some point where the accumulated debts, as they continue to grow, chill economic growth. Um, there's this great book um, called This Time It's Di Different, written by uh, yeah, Rogoff and Reinhardt uh, a few years ago that talks about the relationship between uh, the percentage of debt to GDP. And once you cross a certain threshold, different economists set it at different level levels. Some of them put it at about 80 percent, others put, them, put it at about 100 percent or 105 percent. Um, I don't remember where those two put it, but they put it somewhere in that range. Once you cross over that threshold, you're going to chill economic growth, and, and it becomes a downward spiral. So that is a significant problem. But you're exactly right. It's not just the debt itself, but it's the debt in relationship to uh, GDP growth and uh, uh, the deficit at any moment matters. But we're not really paying attention to any of those things. As a government, we're continuing to offer, operate with rather significant deficits without any plan as to how to turn it around. Thank you. <coughs> um, yeah, let's go to you. Um, hi, Senator. Thank you for coming and speaking to us tonight. Um, you said several times that we want to avoid concentrating the power um, in just a few hands in Washington, D.C. Um, in 2013, you were part of the um, movement in the Republican Party that shut down the government for 16 days. 
Um, wasn't that like one of the ultimate expressions of concentrating the uh, power in the hands of very few people? Oh, sorry, people, because um, it was really a move to further a political agenda that went against the will of the people, nearly cost um, millions of people their jobs, and also cost the country millions of dollars at the same time without actually accomplishing anything. I'm so glad you asked this question. <laughs> she asked about the government shutdown that occurred in 2013. Uh, I'd like to tell you what really happened with that. There were a small handful of us initially in Congress who view steps that were announced in July of 2013 by the President of the United States, then President Obama, uh, to bring about changes to the Affordable Care Act by executive order. Changes that he wasn't authorized by the statute or by the Congress to make, but changes that he justified on the basis that the law wasn't ready to be implemented as written and Congress, he believed, was unwilling to make those changes. In response to that, a number of us said, if it's not ready to be implemented as written, then let's suspend the implementation of it. Let's delay by at least a year the funding for full imp implementation of it. Because if the President of the United States himself says that the uh, flagship piece of legislation that he pushed through Congress isn't ready, then it's not ready. It culminated in an argument that, that focuses on one of the other significant problems in Congress, one that I didn't mention earlier, but that it's closely connected to those, which is that Congress has started a very bad habit over the last few years of focusing every spending decision on one bill. In other words, in any other entity uh, that makes lots of spending decisions, that spends a lot of money, certainly a government that spends nearly $4 trillion a, a, a year, as the U.S. government does, you would think that there would be uh, a number of decision points in that process. By law, in the United States, there's supposed to be a, at least a, a dozen or so separate spending bills, each with its own process. Uh, one bill funding uh, the military, one bill funding um, uh, criminal justice efforts, another one uh, funding veterans' benefits, and so forth. In recent years, that process has been curtailed by leaders of both political parties in, in Congress so as to concentrate all the spending decisions into one bill. Sometimes it's a, a continuing resolution, which is basically a reset button that says, let's keep everything funded at current levels. Sometimes in the form of what's called an omnibus spending bill, where you, you lump all of those spending decisions into one. It's a new bill. You're not just hitting reset, but you're spending it. What we said in 2013, which went uh, underreported and was often um, misreported in 2013, was not, let's shut down the government. I never called for a shutdown of the government, uh, nor did any of the people I was working for. What I said, uh, actually I won't speak for others, I will speak for myself. What I always said was, we need to have multiple spending decisions on spending bills. At a minimum, there, there should be a lot more than that, but at a minimum there should be two bills, two spending bills, and no less. One dealing with the funding of Obamacare, which the president has said is not ready to be implemented. And another one dealing with everything else. We introduced legislation. When we proposed uh, that we consider spending legislation that would have separated those out, uh, President Obama and uh, Majority Leader Reid at the time made the decision that unless we were willing to fund everything in government, then we would not be allowed to fund anything in government. We tried to fund everything in government but Obamacare. They wouldn't let us. The president promised to veto it. Harry Reid said he wouldn't bring it up. We tried to fund just veteran, veterans benefits alone. Harry Reid said he wouldn't bring it up for a vote. President Obama said he'd veto it. Uh, this was what we were dealing with. And what I was saying is, let us have a vote on that issue. Sure, this people had spoken when they passed Obamacare into law. That law had proven not ready to be implemented by the president's own admission. We should have had an opportunity to vote on that, just as we should have an opportunity to vote on every major piece of government as, as a separate divisible piece without lumping everything together. I've sometimes described it this way. If, if you move to a, uh, an outlying rural area, you walked into a grocery store and you thought, I, I've just got to buy the basics, just bread, milk, and eggs. You go to your grocery cart, you put in a loaf of bread and a carton of eggs and a jug of milk, you get to the checkout counter and the cashier says, you can't buy only these items. And you say, what do you mean? 
Well, you, you can't just buy the, these. You have to also buy a half ton of iron ore and a bucket of nails and a Barry Manilow album and a book about cowboy poetry. In fact, you've got to buy one of every item in this entire store if you want to buy any of these items. That is what spending is like in Congress. And it, it continues to be a problem to this day, even under uh, Republican leadership. That is what puts us at the, the, the risk of that kind of, of shutdown every time. It was, to be perfectly clear, not my decision to shut down the government. To suggest that it was would give far too much credit to a, a junior, balding, overweight uh, uh, senator from the Rocky Mountains. This was the decision of the President of the United States acting in concert with the Senate Majority Leader. Right. I'm afraid that's all we have time for uh, this evening. So please join me in thanking uh, Senator Mike Lee. <laughs>